Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Michael Morpurgo. Great to see you. Nice to be here. There were three chairs here a moment ago. What happened to the third one? Well, we will have a couple of special guests joining us a little later, but I'm going to keep that in, uh, in reserve for now. Has so everyone just hold the front that row died and <laughs> they've all died? No, we've just uh, moved them back so that everybody can have a fantastic view of you, Lovely. which is essential. Lucky for them. Uh, now, I know you've brought with you in that little bag um, an iPad with a version of the app. Can I ask you, first of all, how technically minded you are, Michael? Are you a man of the 21st century? Is the, is the War Horse app totally suited to you? Um, actually, the colour isn't, is it? <laughs> I it didn't really want to really clashes, that. doesn't it? Um, but I won't take my trousers off. No, I'm not um, at all uh, technically minded. I'm really not. I, I write by hand. Uh, I hand the manuscript to my wife, Claire, who's here, and she puts it onto a computer. I then can... Um, I can correct it myself. I can, I can now do that quite satisfactorily without too much fear. But when I was handed this thing, I, I was concerned. But I have learnt my code. <laughs> I will now do my code for you. I'm not telling you. Oh, wrong thing. Isn't that amazing? A miracle of modern thank science. You. Michael no. Morpurgo has unlocked the iPad. <laughs> so we think we're in safe hands here. Th thank you. I think that deserves a round so of applause. We'll, we'll ask you to read from that a little later, if we That's may. That's fine, yeah. Um, we're going to talk this afternoon about a little about your life, your career, particularly about War Horse and the phenomenal success of that book. When it was first published in 1982, did you have a sense that it would be a success? Did you know it was a winner, that book? No, on the contrary, I was fairly convinced early on that it um, was not going to be a winner. This is because I had evidence to support that, in that it didn't sell very well. <laughs> I don't think it ever sold. My publisher is here today, but I think in its first 10, 15 years, I don't think it ever did more than 1,000 or 2,000 copies a year. The amazing thing, I mean truly amazing thing, is that they kept it in print. Um, and without them having done that, there would have been no play, and there would have been no film. So it was one of those really, it isn't lucky, it's actually good publishing, someone having faith in it. I think the publishers actually had more faith in it than, than I did. The problem was I had very disappointing news. Um, it was shortlisted for a prize, what's now called the Costa Prize and was called the Whitbread Prize. And it was shortlisted for it and my publishers um, thought it would win. And they told me that, which is a really stupid thing to tell a writer because you get all excited and my wife and I went up on a train to London, dressed up in our fancy gear and a bow tie, and went to this dinner in the city at Whitbread. And it was live on Channel 4 News. And the chairman of the judges was Roald Dahl, and I was going to win the Whitbread Prize. Well, I didn't. Some other beggar won it. <laughs> and I was really disappointed um, and walked out of there with my... An extraordinary thing was that the publishers... They gave me a first-class train fare from Exeter to London, a limousine, I mean, as long and as black as you've ever seen in your life, from Paddington Station to the city. But then when I didn't win it, I walked out of the place and I said to the person accompanying me from the publishers, um, where's the car? It's just like Cinderella. <laughs> it wasn't it there. And gone. I went back oh. on the tube. And that's what you learn. So I was really disappointed. Um, and, and I think I never really hoped for anything more for it than maybe I hoped it would get published once or twice abroad, which it did. It's quite popular in France. It was more popular in France than it was here. Cheval de Guerre was my first book in uh, Gallimard in French. And it, that did go quite well. They identified with it quite strongly there. More strongly, I think, than here. The criticism was at the time, and, I, and it was Roald Dahl told me this. He said, really, it's not a children's book. He said children aren't interested, and I think he's wrong about this. He said they're not really interested in history. I think he was wrong about that, actually. It depends how you tell the story. Um, but I think he was right that at that particular moment, a story about the First World War for young people I think people thought, let's, let parents thought, teachers thought, let's not go there. This was 1980s. We were in the middle of a Cold War. The First and the Second World War were things that really people wanted to get away from, I think. And 
Here was a book that was set very firmly in, in the First World War and in the slaughter of the First World War and didn't pull its punches. And I think he thought, and the other judges probably thought, well, it's, it's not a children's book. I think they may be right. Given its success and the fact that it's now available, I think, in 40 languages? Yeah, but that's Spielberg. That's the Spielberg factor. It was in, uh, I think, three languages uh, until Mr. Spielberg decided to make a film of it, and then suddenly it was 43 or something. Did you get the call? Does one get a phone call from Mr. Spielberg? Sort of. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a really extraordinary thing, but we, Claire and I, we run this project in Devon, where I live in, Iddesley, where we get kids and come and live on the farm. It's called Farms for City Children. We've been doing it for 35 years now, and we're passionate about it. It's the best story I ever wrote, that's for sure, this charity we run, Farms for City Children. But the problem is that the kids are living down the lane from us in a big Victorian house, and we know that if the phone rings seven days a week, we have to answer that phone. Um, and I think my family got very fed up with the fact that if the phone rang at weekends or whenever they were there in the evenings, one of us had to answer it. And so we made a little silly family joke, and this is true. The joke was, oh, I'd better answer it. It could be Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, it sort of was, really. Funny. Well, I thought it was funny. <laughs> in the recent biography that Maggie Ferguson wrote of you, yeah. War Child to War Horse, um, she talks about the fact that you weren't a bookish child. So where did your love of language and books come from, then? From my mother. My mother was an, uh, an actress, uh, and like all mothers, very beautiful and with a wonderful voice. And she would sit on our bed. My elder brother and Peter would live in the same room, uh, sleep in the same room, and she would sit on our bed and read us a story 10 minutes, quarter an hour, every single night. And the thing that I got from my mother, which was quite extraordinary, is that she only read poems and stories which she herself loved. So what she was doing, and of course I didn't know it at the time, was that she was passing on to me what she really cared about. And because she read it like that, every single story that she read and every single poem it simply became part of my bloodstream. And so I loved, actually, the sound of music in words, and particularly her voice. So if I hear now, which I do, or read now, The Elephant's Child by Rudyard Kipling from The Just So Stories, I hear her voice in my head as I read the text. It's that strong. And then the trouble was that in those days, you kind of life was very divided. There was that moment, those precious moments with parents which lasted actually a relatively short time and then it was school and the desks were in lines and it was all very much then what we now call literacy with a very big L so it was about spelling it was about punctuation it was about tidy handwriting and I really wasn't good at it and I particularly wasn't good at something they called comprehension because I thought stories were there to be listened to and just to just to soak in really and then the teachers came up with these questions and they made me nervous and I didn't like it and I turned away from stories uh, and I didn't really turn back to them until I was at university. And then I had a, another lucky thing, a professor who sat on a desk and read us, I remember, Gawain and the Green Knight, um, and did it the same way that my mother did, because he loved it, and it worked. And then I found myself doing it to children in a class that I was teaching of year sixes in a primary school. And I could see myself, hang on, this is working. I'm reading what I love, and they love it as a consequence. So it's been a kind of a a difficult course for me to come back to. And I'm still not a, a, a good reader. I still don't like small, right, small print uh, crowded onto a page. I was made to read Oliver Twist when I was about seven, and it was in one of those editions where the print was very packed. And um, I, I couldn't get on with it, and that made me feel very stupid. Uh, and I, I do have this feeling deep down that stories are there to be told, read aloud, like poetry. The poetry to me comes alive when it's read aloud. Off the page, I find it... I still find it hard. I don't think I've really grown up away from that fear, to be honest. Can we encourage you then to read aloud for us now, if you would, please? Well, yes, but it's gone off the machine now. <laughs> I, I, I was already a moment ago. At the beginning of the book, there's an author's note, which is actually part of the fiction, only you don't know it when you start reading it. In the old school, they use now for the village hall. Below the clock that has stood always at one minute past ten hangs a small, dusty painting of a horse. He stands, a splendid red bay, 
with a remarkable white cross emblazoned on his forehead and with four perfectly matched white socks. He looks wistfully out of the picture, his ears pricked forward, his head turned as if he has just noticed us standing there. To many who glance up at it casually, as they might do when the hall is opened up for parish meetings, for harvest suppers or evening socials, it is merely a tarnished old oil painting of some unknown horse by a competent but anonymous artist. To them, the picture is so familiar that it commands little attention. But those who look more closely will see, written in fading black copper plate writing across the bottom of the bronze frame, Joey, painted by Captain James Nichols, autumn 1914. Some in the village, only a very few now, and fewer as each year goes by, remember Joey as he was. His story is written so that neither he, nor those who knew him, nor the war they lived and died in, will be forgotten. So. Thank you. Michael, as you said, that author's note is actually part of the fiction. So what was the fact? Where did this story of the suffering of war through the eyes of a horse, where did you get that idea from? Well, I got lucky, and I think writers have to get lucky, particularly with this sort of thing. I, I had written uh, maybe five or six books up until that time, all of which had been... I, I, I'd kept to what I... I'd kept to, the, I think, what writers should keep to, which is what they either know about or they care about, or a mixture of the two. And therefore, because I was a teacher, I'd written a, a lot about children in school, children at home. Um, it'd been rather domestic, if you like, children's stories. But then I moved to Devon, to this little place, Iddersley, to set up the project Farms for City Children. Found myself in a tiny community of no more than about 100 people, tiny little village, pub, village shop, church, and these people, and all of whom I got to know very quickly because there's so few of them. And I learned, this was in 1976, I think, that there were three old men in that village who had been to the First World War. Um, and I got to know them. I rang the bells with one of them in the church and met them from time to time at evening socials, at carol services, stuff like that. I kind of knew them as the, you know, the great old men of the village. Not necessarily very approachable. But then I walked into the pub one day in 1979, I think it was, um, and there was one of them, a man called Wilf Ellis, sitting by the fire with a beer in his hand. And no one else was in the pub, so you kind of had to talk to him because it would have been unfriendly not to. So I got myself a beer and I went and sat opposite him and there was the fire and he was across there. And I, I just opened a conversation. I said, Wilf, um, they, they told me you, were, you went to the First World War. He said... Yes. They don't talk very much in Devon. That's another thing which I had to get used to. Talking is not what they like. They think a lot, a great deal. But they don't necessarily express themselves very easily. So then I said, well, how old were you when you went? And he said, uh, 17. And I said, how long were you out there? Four years. And then the most extraordinary thing happened. I just said to him, what regiment were you with? And he said, I was with the Devon Yeomanry. I was there with horses. So I said, cavalry then, yes, with horses, he said. And then he just started talking. And his talking was so moving and so touching to me. Here's the thing, I've been brought up, like a lot of people of my generation, on the history of the First World War. I knew something about it, probably mostly through the great poets of the First World War. Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen, Edward Thomas. These people, their, their poetry I had studied and I knew it, and that's that was my vision, along with the paintings of Paul Nash of, of the First World War. And I suddenly realized here I was sitting across the fire from someone who had actually been there, and he'd done it. And he seemed to be wanting to tell me about it. And this is bizarre, because later on I spoke to his wife, and she said he'd never, ever opened up about this ever before, and he'd opened up to someone who was almost a stranger. And he talked, and he talked, and he told me things that you can never read in books. I'll just tell you a couple of things that he said about the horse, for instance, which made me write this story. He said that you get to know your horse so well, he's your constant companion, 
and you suddenly realize that you care for him more than you care for anyone else on this earth, which includes the people back home because they've almost disappeared out of your memory view because you're so focused on surviving till the next day. And then he said you could tell the horse things that you couldn't tell your best friends in your company. Because what you really wanted to talk about and you couldn't talk about was your fear. You'd seen your friend blown to bits the day before. Everyone had seen it. The last thing anyone wanted to do was to talk about it. But it was simply deep inside him. And he said, I could stand there with this horse and tell this horse what I'd seen, the horror of it and what I felt about it. And then he could talk about his fear and he could talk about his longing to be home, all the things really he simply couldn't say to his friends. And he said, this is what, because he described it so beautifully, he said, I could, I'd stand there in the horse lines and he'd be eating his hay and I'd be listening to this crunching going on of his jaws and the teeth on the hay and the sound of the rain in the puddles because it was all, most of it was in the open. And I'd have my hand, he said, on the warmth of his neck and I'd be whispering into his ear and he says, and I'm telling you, that horse listened to me. And I knew this was a man who wasn't sentimental at all. This was a hard-working person who lived in the countryside, worked the countryside, and he was telling me the truth. And I then went and asked the two other old men later on about this. And all of them came up with, I suppose it wasn't just detail, it was this sense that Part of them had been left behind over there, that they never were the same people when they came back, all three of them. And as a writer, I suddenly felt for the first time, and I've felt it since, that someone was telling me a story that was so precious to them that they didn't want it to die, that they were handing it on to someone who could tell it. I mean, he knew I was a writer, I was a published writer by this time, and I, I know no other reason why he would have told me. And I felt at the time, I felt it was a kind of a confidential story but he still wanted me to write about it and I shall always be grateful it was and, and what I've learned about that with all my writing now is that the truth that I write about the events the tales it's so important to get under the skin of them and if you can talk to people who've been there sometimes it's not always possible of course but if you possibly can do that so it's um that's really what got me the next day to ring up the Imperial War Museum in London and I asked them the question, I said, how many horses um, went to the, second world, to the First World War from the UK? And they said, well, we can't be sure, but we think it was about a million. And they came from all over, many of them came from America and from Canada, shipped over because we didn't have enough horses. And then I said, and how many came back? And their reply, they said, oh yeah, well, that we do know. It was 65,000. So I did the sums in my head, and the sums added up, roughly speaking, not exactly, but roughly speaking, that the same number of horses on our side were killed as the number of men. We lost nearly a million horses and nearly a million men. And if you extrapolate from that outwards to all the other armies, the Russians, the Germans, the French, the Belgians, the Americans, the Canadians, we think, we can't be sure, that in the region of 10 million soldiers were killed, so roughly 10 million horses died, and they died, of course, in exactly the same way as the men died. They were blown to pieces, they died on the wire, they drowned in the mud, they were machine gunned, they died of exhaustion, and they d did it together. So I thought, well, follow a horse, follow a horse through that war, uh, and maybe it'll tell you something more about that war um, than you can possibly imagine, and, and it did. You talk about this being a story that was essentially handed on to you, mm. and from you it's been handed on to a vast number of people. Do you feel like the book, I mean, thinking of the app, for instance, suddenly has a life of its own? It's become an entity, a thing that just keeps propelling itself into new dimensions because it went onto the stage and then the movies and then an app. Well, that is what's so wonderful about this app, and it's why I'm here today, really. It's because I know this way of telling the story, with its breadth and its depth, is going to reach many, many more millions of of readers. Um, why is that important to me? Because I do think, Alan Bennett once said it in his wonderful play, The History Boys, um, that actually it is what we are here for. It's simply to pass it on. That was the expression he used, or his teacher there used. We're here to pass it on. That's it. Finish. 
We're not here to explain the world to children, to make it simple for them. We're here simply to say, this is how I've seen the world. This is what I think about the world. And this is what I'm passing on. And that's what Will Fellis did to me. And I suppose in whether it's the book or it's the play, which certainly increased uh, people's understanding and knowledge of the book, or the film, which did it hugely, or the app, which will do it even more hugely. Yes, it's wonderful. And I now get letters from people all over the world, and I mean all over the world, um, from China and from Germany and from Australia. And what's really interesting is how people's own lives can go back into their own stories and link up somehow with Warhorse. I'll give you an example. I had the most extraordinary letter from, actually it was from America, but it was from a, a German-American, an American-German, I don't know what she considers herself, who was a grandmother, who sent me a picture of her grandfather, who was this little kid of 14, in his grey uniform with this lovely hat on with a red band, standing beside this huge horse with that wonderful look. You noticed soldiers, when they were posing, they always had their chins right up. And he was posing like this, trying to stretch himself to be 17. And this huge great horse standing there. And she wrote in the letter, uh, he came back, but the horse didn't. And that's what's lovely. It's the awakening of memories, I think. And when I sit in the play of War Horse, and I wait till it's all finished, and people are wipe, wiping the tears from their faces, what you realize is that it affects old people and parents and young people in different ways. They bring their own lives to it and make of it what they can. And that's what's been lovely, is to realize that maybe the story is for a much wider audience than I ever imagined. Let's hear a little more of that story now, because one of the things I really love about this app is that you perform the piece with a couple of musicians. We'll talk about that later. There's an abridged yeah. version of the, of the novel. Yes. Let's hear a little bit of that performance now, if we may. And then I saw my Albert running towards me through the crowd. He pulled the reins out of Captain Nichols' hand. Joey, he's my horse, he's my horse. And he always will be, no matter who buys him. If Joey goes with you, I, I go too. I want to join up, sir. Well, you certainly got the right spirit for a soldier, said Captain Nichols. What, what's your name, lad? Narricot, sir. Albert Narricot. And how old are you, Albert? Seventeen, sir. Well, almost. You're too young. Come back next year and we'll see. What's done is done. This horse belongs to the army now. But don't worry, lad. I'll take good care of your Joey. You've done a fine job in him. So when you're old enough, come and join us in the yeomanry. And you must mention my name. I'm Captain Nichols, and I'll be proud to have you with us. And Joey will be fine. Can, can I say goodbye then, sir? Albert wriggled my nose for me. I'll find you again. You always silly. I will. You hear this? And it'll be me. You listen for me, Joey. Look for me. And I'll look for you. Wherever you are, I'll find you, Joey, and that's a true promise. It's of a brisk young plough boy a ploughing on the plain, and his horse it stood down in yonder glade. It was down in yonder glade he went whistling to plough, and by chance there he met a pretty. Now we do that, that concert maybe five or six times a year. John Tams, who's the song maker on the, uh, the play, he was the person who put these extraordinary songs together. He's a wonderful folk singer. And that was Barry Coop you saw singing, and we, we do the concert, which is an abridged version of you saying we do it up and down the country, which I love doing because it's, again, bringing the story to, to life for me. I want to look at another dimension of bringing this story to life, which is that, as I said earlier, we have two rather special guests who I would like to welcome on stage now, uh, Tristan Langlois is Head of Education at the National Army Museum in Chelsea, which looks at the British Army, its role, its impact on world history. Uh, joining him is Private Tommy Atkins. Uh, in his 1914 soldier's uniform, I can let you into a secret, he's not a real World War I soldier. But uh, Tristan is going to tell us what we can learn from his uniform. 
Certainly. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What you're looking at is a soldier ready to go into battle in 1914, right at the start of the First World War. The uniform changes over time, but at the start of the war, it was still already pretty good as far as military minds were concerned. Uh, if we start from the top and work our way down, we all have, have our service dress cap and uniform. It's all in khaki, as you can see. At home, Tommy here would probably have worn a bright red uniform, much the same as soldiers would have been wearing both in battle and out of battle for a couple of hundred years before. But by now, it's the 20th century, we understand about camouflage. So the soldier has gone into this khaki, which is in fact, an Indian word for the colour, a sort of muddy, dun colour that will conceal the soldier to a certain extent. The material is wool, so it's a thick, heavy surge wool, not waterproof, but at least water resistant, so it'll give you an element of protection, at least when you are deployed. And over the top of the uniform, obviously there are badges and buttons and indicators as to which bit of the army Tommy is in. Presumably, in case he forgets himself, he can just look on his shoulders, and uh, if he uh, is picked out, he can proudly declaim he's in the Middlesex Regiment or such and such a regiment, such and such a unit. Regimental identity and pride, very important to the British Army now in the 21st century, just as important for the regular army. And Tommy in 1914 would have belonged to the regular army, the professional, voluntary British Expeditionary Force being deployed overseas, supplemented to a certain extent by the reservists and the yeomanry and the militias that were being sent at the same time but this professional soldier would have had a great deal of pride in the regiment to which he belonged. Over the top of that, of course, Tommy is wearing his webbing. The webbing, which is 1908 pattern webbing, is the envy of the militarized world in 1914. Uh, the Germans and the French military minds at least think this stuff is really rather cutting edge because it's everything that the soldier needs in one handy cotton webbing sort of waistcoat configuration. At the front, most obviously, you've got little pockets, and each of these little pockets contains uh, clips of ammunition for Tommy's rifle. Uh, we didn't bring the rifle along today. Uh, Tommy will, of course, be uh, spoken to sternly by his sergeant later on for having abandoned his rifle, but we thought probably traipsing through London traffic uh, at the rush hour with a rifle might not be such a good idea. But the rifle, of course, needed ammunition, and the ammunition is carried in these pockets, which are distributed across the body to even out the weight, to make it easier for Tommy to carry it around. Uh, on the uh, sides, we have Tommy's small pack, which contains his hussif, as it's called, it's sort of a cleaning kit, a repair kit. Uh, it's got various other personal ephemera in it, stuff that he wants to carry into the trenches themselves. Over on the other side, you can see that he's carrying his water bottle, because his iron rations and his drink, which he carries in those bits of kit, will be very important for his survival in the tours of trenches in which he will eventually be involved. If I could ask briefly for Tommy to turn around, or about face. Uh, you can see other elements of the kit and the equipment back here. The large pack, which continues, contains uh, Tommy's great coat. Uh, and down here, a mess tin. The mess tin is the utensil in which Tommy cooks, out of which he eats, out of which he also washes, rather impressively. There is, in fact, an army drill in 1914, which enables Tommy to wash himself completely while on campaign, out of the quantity of water that's found in the mess tin and shave. And I'm not inclined to ask for a demonstration right here, given that there is a family audience here present. That could get a bit grisly, I think, so, uh, so we won't do that. But down below here, we also have this rather curious little implement, which we'll heft out. That's an entrenching tool. Uh, it fits to the little handle, the wooden handle, down here. Excuse me, Tommy, while I circle them out. And that entrenching tool fits together rather neatly because while it's not anticipated when the British Expeditionary Force goes to war necessarily that they'll be involved in trench warfare, that's something that comes as a bit of a surprise in 1914, obviously Tommy's going to need to be able to scrape himself a bit of extra cover, get his head down while he's conducting those early, quite open battles of the First World War. If I could ask you to turn about once again. Uh, this is top to toe, and as we get to the, uh, the lower man, uh, we come obviously to khaki trousers, uh, boots, and in between, putties. Putties are that curious bandage-like garment that's wrapped around the lower leg. The putties are designed essentially to make the lower leg water-resistant, uh, which they do to a certain extent, support the calf, stop stuff getting into your boots, and it's a lengthy bit of bandage, essentially, that's wrapped from bottom to top 
and gives that very characteristic silhouette for soldiers of the First World War. It's not unique to the First World War, but I think it's very characteristic of the image that we have of the soldier in the First World War. You don't have it in the Second World War so much, for example. This changes across time. I suppose we think of the First World War sometimes as being a war of stasis, of things that don't evolve, but technology does. All kinds of technologies are flung uh, at the front line, particularly on the Western Front in the course of the First World War. And so, uh, as the years go by, this would change. If you want to learn uh, about the ways in which the soldier might have evolved uh, between 1914 and 1916, for example, the ways in which Tommy might uh, have adopted his steel helmet while he lived in trenches to avoid getting smacked on the head by bits of flying shell and shrapnel in France and Belgium as the shells rained down, or if you wish to learn the solution to the mystery of why, in 1915, it might have been wise to go into the trenches with a pair of socks and a full bladder. I'm going to leave it there for you to puzzle over. We recommend you have a look at the app, because these and other insights, not just about soldiers in the British Army, but all the armies, uh, are given on the app in great detail, and uh, I trust you'll enjoy them when you access them. That's it uh, for now. That's about as much as we can cover. Any questions? Then uh, I think you can relax a little. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Private Tommy Atkins, thank you very thank much you very indeed. Much. And okay. thank you to Tristan Langlois. <laughs> Tristan just giving us a few uh, insights there, a sense of some of the insights that you get on the app. I mean, huge amounts of history in there, Michael. I suppose one of the lovely things about having an app is that it's your story surrounded by a sort of 360-degree view of the history, the themes, the battles, uh, all sorts of things about what that war was and what it meant. Yes, I mean, I mean the trouble is when you see someone standing like this, and we know we're in an app store and it's nearing Christmas, and you see someone standing there like that and it all, he's clean and he's dry. What we all have to understand is that they were never clean and they were never dry. And they suffered massively from trench foot for having permanently wet feet. They suffered from lice and, of course, the fear we talked about. So what's wonderful about the app is that it allows our, our imagination to go deeper than, than, than the book does, in a way. It informs us around the book, I think, in, in, a, in a rather wonderful way. It means you come out of the reading of the book through the app, uh, having been much, much better informed about the history and of what these people went through, so that when you do go, and I think all children should go, I have to say, to the place in France where these nearly a million of them of our side lie, and actually the other 10 million too, and you see them, and you realize that's what they look like when they march down the streets of Portsmouth or Southampton or London, that's what they look like, fine young lads, and then you see them lying there, and then you have to ask your question, self the question, which this book asks, and which the app asks as well, is why, um, when will we ever learn, all those questions which are so important. You don't write about war and you don't make an app about war just to entertain people. In fact, you don't do it at all to entertain people. It's done because we all want to know and understand more about what, what it is and why it is we seem to go back to doing it and doing it. It's, it's a serious subject. It's not, it's not just an app or a book or a movie or a play. But fascinating that we can do that with a work of literary fiction sitting alongside pieces of historical fact and that those things mutually support each other. Absolutely. They don't need to be found in different places. No, absolutely. And if, if Charles Dickens were sat here, and wouldn't it be great if he was, <laughs> and there was an app of Oliver Twist, and we were able to have uh, him talking about the origins of that story and of the poverty in London streets and the abuse of children and crime and all these things. Uh, and we were able to have some historical reckoning of it alongside as well. Our understanding of that book um, and indeed of the author would be that much greater. And I think, I think that's important. You talked at the start about War Horse being a book for children. You wrote it as a book for children. You still believe it to be a book that's important for children. What to you then is the secret of a successful children's book? You've written well over 100 of them. Far too many, yes. I, I don't think, I mean, I didn't write it for children. I just wrote it. And I think because my audience, generally speaking, had been children. I was a teacher for nine years in primary school. I'd been a child myself. 
I like to add that when there are children sitting there because they simply don't believe it. And you don't forget, or you shouldn't forget, that's for sure. And I think we do draw, draw this artificial line between childhood and adulthood as if somehow there's this great wall that separates us. Well, actually, there isn't. If you tell a good story to grandparents, parents and children, and you tell it with commitment as if you mean it, everyone will listen. Children do, it is true, listen much better if they find themselves in it. I think that's absolutely true. The identification of children with a book, they have to see, yes, I'm in that, I could be there. So a young soldier going to that war is important. And of course, they identify with animals, they understand about fair play almost instinctively, it seems to me. Um, so yeah, I don't think I write for them, but I think it's important to include them. That's what I feel. And what's been marvelous about this app is that it's for everyone. The play of War Horse is absolutely for everyone, and so was the film. I think when I sat down to write the book, I just wrote it because of Will Fellis, because of, because of Iddesley, because of Edward Thomas, because of Wilfred Owen and the pity of war and all this sort of... That, those are the reasons behind the writing of it. I wasn't thinking it's going to be for someone like him. I mean, I wouldn't write a book just for you, would I? I mean, you wouldn't, would you? If you understand what I'm saying. Him and you, perhaps. You'd sell more that way. <laughs> I'd like to open up questions now to the floor. If anybody wants to ask Michael a question, could you just raise your hand and then somebody with a wandering microphone. Hello, there's a young lady at the back here. Just wait for the microphone to reach you, if you would. Um, what's your favourite part of War Horse? Um, my favourite part is what the book is all about, which is the meeting in the middle of the German soldier and the Welsh soldier. Um, this is a book for me, it, it's a book about, it's not really a war story at all, it's about reconciliation. This is really about people dressed in different uniforms, all being sent from their factories and their farms from all over Europe and other places to fight this war. Most of them didn't even know why they were fighting it. Um, I think it's important, I remember Wilf telling me, or no, it wasn't Wilf, it was one of the others telling me in the village. I said, why did you go? And he said, I went because everyone else went. And he said something quite extraordinary. He said, I'd, as a young man, I'd, I'd kill a rabbit because I could eat it. And I'd kill a rat because I didn't like rats. But I was asking myself while I was out there, why am I killing Germans? I don't even know any Germans. And it, it was a really, really big question. So for me, the marvelous moment of the book is when the two get together and they shake hands and they toss a coin for the horse. To me, that's the great moment of the story. There's a wonderful, I don't know if you know this, but there was an extraordinary moment in Christmas 1914 when it was just Christmas Eve, I think, uh, and the trenches on both sides, the Germans decided or one German decided that it was Christmas time and we won't be fighting. And so he climbed out of his trench and waving a flag, a white flag, and calling out, Tommy, we have sausage, we have schnapps. And it was a bit of a time, but then some young English guy got up and he was waving a flag too. And before you knew it, they drifted across towards each other, these enemies. And they met in the middle, and they did exchange sausage and schnapps and whiskey. And do you know what they did? They played a game of football. It was amazing. And I read a wonderful letter from a German officer back to his wife, which went something like this. Liebling, I'm writing to you with the best of news. On Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, we had a truce with the Tommies. And we met them in the middle, and we shook hands. And then we played a game of football. And I am proud to say to you, meine Liebling, that the score was Fritz 2, Tommy 1. <laughs> it's just the most moving thing to read a letter. And that man died six months later. And you read that and you think, well, the person whose hand he shook could have been the person who killed him. It's the metaphor for all wars, really. So I think that the answer to your question is the meeting in the middle for me. Have you read the book yourself? Which do you think is the best bit in it? That bit. So we are agreed. We're so right. 
Any more questions, please? Are you going to write any more books? Sorry? Are you going to write any more books? You sound like my publisher. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I'm always writing books. Always, I don't stop writing books. When I finish one, I'm, I'm going on with the next one. I've just had a book out quite recently, also about the First World War, about the first black officer ever to serve in the British Army. Um, it was inspired by him, a man called Walter Tull. Um, and I've been, in a way, lost in that story for a bit. And now I'm actually writing a film script of another of my books. I, I wrote a story called The Mozart Question. Have you read The Mozart Question? You haven't? Why not? <laughs> Go instantly to a bookshop and buy The Mozart Question. Um, well, you don't, if you've got a parent here, talk to this parent, educate this parent, <laughs> take it to a bookshop, and you'll be fine. It's a good story, but we're making a, a, better, a better thing of it and calling it a film. That's what I'm doing at the moment, so I'm not being idle. You're going to be a publisher when you grow up, I know you are. There thank was this one here. Thank you for your question. What was your idea for Alone on a Wide, Wide Sea? Where did my idea come from for Alone on a Wide, Wide Sea? Most of the people here being completely ignorant, will not have read this book. I will prove this to you. Hands up those of you who have read Alone on a Wide, Wide Sea. Yeah, that's two, it's three. It's, that's why I said it's pathetic, isn't it? Um, I have to tell them a bit, otherwise it makes no sense. But this is a story about a kid, actually many kids, who were sent away from this country just after the Second World War because they were unwanted children. Um, the people... It, it was strange. It was the children's charities got together, and because no one wanted these children, and they wanted to close down children's homes, they decided that in Australia there were people who would want these children. And it was kind of planned, but not properly planned. These children were put on a boat, sometimes 2,000 at a time in Liverpool, and just sent off to Australia. And 60 years later, what we discover is that some of them had fantastic homes. It was great, but others of them had the most terrible lives, lives of slavery and abuse, and they're only now telling their stories. In fact, Gordon Brown got up not long ago in Parliament and apologised for it. But I found out about that story and so wanted to write it. But I wanted somehow to get this story to come back home again. Now, you'll know the book is in two parts, isn't it? It's the, the story going out there of this young boy in Australia who grows to be a man in his whole life. And then the second part of the book is the, the story, the second part is his daughter coming back to England to find out the secret of their family, where her father came from. And because the father had planned to sail back, he's a boat builder, he loves boats, and his daughter loves boats, and the, sadly the father dies. And the daughter does this thing on her own. She sails around the world, all the way from Australia um, to England. And the reason I wrote the story was because I heard the, one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard in my life. I had a friend, an Australian friend, who said, you've got to go uh, and look up my website. Now, you'll know now because you've seen what happens. I find that quite difficult, looking up people's <laughs> website. But I am sailing, he said, all the way from Hobart, Tasmania, that's Australia, all the way to Falmouth, and then I'm going to sail all the way back again. And I, I'd love you to follow me because each day I'm going to update my website and show you the longitude, the latitude, and each day you'll find out how I'm getting on. So I thought, great. And I have a friend living locally who understood about these things, and we'd update it. And an amazing thing happened. He's in the South Atlantic, and he's, he's sort of my age. He's a sort of 65-year-old git he was at the time. And he's there in this 31-foot yacht called the Berry Miller with his friend. And he's sitting on deck at night, and he's got a Guinness, and his friend has got a Guinness, and it's a calm sea for a change. This all came through on the website, and he's looking up at the sky, and he sees this light going across the night sky. And so he goes, what's that? And his friend says, I think I know what that is. I just want to check. Goes downstairs, emails to headquarters in Sydney, says, look, we're at this longitude, this latitude. We've just seen a light go across the eastern sky. I think it's such and such, I won't tell you because it'll spoil the story. And uh, anyway, 10 minutes later comes back this email. Yes, you're right. That is the International Space Station going overhead. And they're sitting there and they think, well, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be good to talk to those guys? <laughs> and so the email back to headquarters said, look, could we get in touch with them? And so back at Sydney, they say, oh, we'll try. And they email NASA. And NASA comes back and says, yeah, we'll ask them. 
and they asked these astronauts. And the astronauts came back and said, yeah, cool. And so there was this conversation which went on for three to four weeks between these two old guys on their little tin yacht going around the world and this American astronaut, miles and miles above, also going around. I just thought this was marvelous as a wonderful, wonderful story, but it's not the end of it. When he arrives in Falmouth, and you'll know this from the story, he's tying up his boat and they're walking down the quay in Falmouth and they see this man coming towards him. And it's the American astronaut who's come down in wherever they come down these days, Kazakhstan, and he's with his family. And he wants his family to meet these extraordinary people he's met. And I thought, that's my story. <laughs> so that's why I wrote it. Great question. Thank you. We've got time for one last there's very a, quick question. There's a grown-up child there. Yeah. Oh, and there's a boy there as well. Okay, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll let you both do them and we'll keep the answers briefish. If we could go for this young lady first. Was it you who put your hand up? Go ahead. What's your favourite story? Oh, do you mean my rubbish or someone else's rubbish? My rubbish. Um, oh, it's really difficult because, I mean, it's difficult to explain, but when you make a story, and I expect you've done this yourself, you make it yourself. It's your baby, okay? We all love our babies. And I love my books a lot. I really care about them. And I find it very difficult to have a favorite. So I tend to pick for my favorites those books that people I love like a lot. So my wife, Claire, loves Warhorse. This is because I think she has been proved right. And there's nothing women like better than to be proved right. You will learn this as you grow up. So to some extent, I have to say that book has been really kind to me and I love it dearly. But hand on heart, there are books I think that are better. I think Private Peaceful is better. There's one called book. Twist of Gold, which I love. Mostly I love Twist of Gold because lots of people hated it. There was a review written about that book in a newspaper, which I'm now going to advise you never to buy. It's called The Guardian. <laughs> they wrote a review of that book years and years ago, which slammed it. Um, never, never buy The Guardian. <laughs> I don't mean it much. <laughs> Final question from the young man who's just sitting over there. Is it, is it true in Butterfly Lion that you read, a, you read about one of the scores because it was so bad? Yes. The, do you mean at the beginning of the book? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it wasn't just because it was bad. It's because I went to that school. I, I went to the school when I was seven. It was a boarding school. And lots of people coming from my kind of background in those days were sent off to boarding school really quite early. So I was. And I was very homesick, and I didn't like it, and I tried to run away from school. And you know from the beginning of Butterfly Lion sort of what happened. The true story is that I ran away at school. I, I did it this way. We were, it was miles away out in the countryside, this school. It was like an old castle. Have you ever read a book? Probably you haven't. It's, it's not known very much. It's called Harry Potter. You have. What's the name of the school? Hogwarts. I went there. She never went there. I went there. And it wasn't at all about magic and witches. It was about the cane and other things like rugby and cross-country runs and cold baths. Very strange places. But anyway, the point is, from that school, I was so homesick one day that I ran away and I'd gone no more than half a mile down the road to the school in Sussex when this car drew up and it was pouring with rain and I'm seven years old in my school uniform and this window goes down, this old lady leans out and she says, are you all right, dear? I said, no. She said, well, you're from that school up the road because I'm in my uniform. And she said, you all right, dear? I said, no. She said, where do you live, dear? I said, London. She said, it's 100 miles to London. You can't run all the way to London. Get in the car. Now, you know, never, never, never get in anyone's car. But it was then. And it was a, a little, little old lady. And there was a dog in the back. And I was wet. And I was frightened. And I got in the car. And she took me back to her, her home. And I was soaked through. And she took off my shoes. And she put the shoes in the oven. And she gave me a sticky bun. And she gave me hot tea. And she said, now, dear, what are we going to do with you? She said, I tell you what. I'll ring up the headmaster. I said, no, because that would have meant the cane. 
And then she said, I'll ring your mum and dad. Do you know? No, I said, because they'd have been furious. So in the end, she said, well, what are we going to do? I know, she said, I know. After you've had your tea and you've dried off a bit, I'll take you back. You only be gone about an hour or so. I'll drive you, and I won't drive you up the drive. Where I'll drop you off in the woods, and you can run through, and no one will ever know you've run away. And that's what I did. And that's why the first chapter of the Butterfly Lion is about this boy running away from school. Okay. You can even go down and see the school. It's still there. But it's not a school anymore. It's a been fantastic divided question. Divided into flats now. Good. We're pleased it's gone. A fantastic question to close on. Can we please give our thanks to Tristan Langlois, to Private Tommy Atkins, beautifully displaying his uniform, to Michael Morpogo, and also to you for joining us today. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you.